uh, we're going to check in with somebody. All right, and so we're going to try to do that right here, right now. Lord willing, this all goes as planned. All right, hey, Brother David. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you today? Fine. We, we, uh, first time we talked, right? No. Yeah, right. <laughs> Actually, this, this is our second time through this. We did this in the first session. Uh, this is David and Dee Dee Sterling, all the way from Siberia, and we're talking to them uh, right now live. Isn't that awesome? Getting the opportunity to do that. And so, David, how's things going there for you and your wife? Hi, Dee Dee. <laughs> uh, how's things going there in Siberia? They're going pretty good. In fact, it's ironic that, uh, according to my clock, as of 18 minutes ago, uh, we've now been here for 16 years. We arrived on November 2nd uh, here 16 years ago. Is that right? Matter of fact, by the way, just to let everybody know, we're going back in the future right now um, because <laughs> we've gone back in the future because it's Monday where you're at right now. Is that right? Uh, 18 minutes into it, yes, sir. That's what I thought. So it's Monday there. We're still on Sunday, so... Our time frame is like, I've got him staying up late tonight. I think I got his son in trouble earlier. Uh, <laughs> I saw somebody roaming around in the background. I said, oh, there's your son. He's like, he better not be. And I'm like, uh-oh, I didn't mean to get him in trouble. But uh, then I noticed the clock in behind David's head there and said that it was uh, at that time, I guess it was a little after 11 o'clock. But anyway, we appreciate you coming. And uh, can you hear us okay and everything? Yes, sir, clear okay. as can be. Oh, good, good, good. So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what's happening there in Siberia. If you could give us a little update to the ministry there, we'd appreciate that. Sure. Well, uh, it's one of these places where you plot along, and uh, things are going slowly but surely. Uh, we're looking right now at a couple pieces of property, uh, hopefully to uh, put a building up or actually use an existing structure and make it into a church uh, sometime in the, in the near future, hopefully. Um, Russia is one of those countries where people uh, orientate around the building, so they think of a church as a building, not necessarily a group of people. Uh, so we've been encouraged by our pastor and others that, you know, maybe it's time to go ahead um, in this newer work here. We've been working here for about six years in this area uh, to go ahead and pursue getting uh, getting a structure up. So Amen. that's, that's awesome. one of the things we're looking at. Now, what kind of structure, what, what will that look like? Um, you know, what kind of materials is that built of and all that? Um, I actually I actually helped start a construction company here. So there's a lot of different construction uh, methods and such that people use here. But most likely here it would be a masonry building. So like you would have a, a block type structure. Um, and then for the winter, the most efficient thing is we just tend to put uh, radiated floors pumping uh, heated fluid uh, through a, a masonry mass floor. Uh, but as far as what it looks like, you know, pretty much that's just, uh, you know, a, a box is the most efficient, easiest thing uh, right. to heat and to keep, uh, to keep heated. Uh, so then if we, you know, throw a steeple on top of it, great. If not, then we'll just see. Right. So you're saying that it'd be a masonry building and then it'd be heated through, uh, through the floor doing a heating system. Is that pretty common there in Siberia to heat a home or a building uh, through the floor like that? It, it has become popular within about the last, uh, I'd have to say within about the last six years. Um, the last three or four years, it's really seen a pickup and a lot of people are doing it now. Um, in fact, the church we initially worked with that we helped to build uh, in the uh, almost, well, in the, in the large area of Krasnyarsk, they put one of those systems in just, uh, I guess it was two years ago, wasn't it? About two years ago, they put it in, and it's been extremely efficient, very effective. Gotcha. So the bad part to that would be if a kid walked in with canned chocolate, dropped it on the floor, that probably would be a mess, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you've got to have... <laughs> you got to have tile floors here, and the, the, the ladies here, uh, not so much anymore, but they still do sometimes. They tend to wear heels. It's uh -huh. always high heels. And they usually have uh, metal spikes on the ends of them during the winter. Um, so uh, 
we, we've had to replace tile and grout and things like that a number of times from it just being uh, tore up by the lady's shoes, to be gotcha. honest with you. I see. Well, I guess what I was referring to is if the floor is heated and it's emanating heat, you drop something that's going to melt on that. It's going to, I would assume, melt pretty quickly. Oh, and, nice sticky mess, yes. Yeah, nice sticky mess. Chewing gum, just kind of like, yeah. So <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Well, that um, there in the work and ministry, um, you know, the, in the territory that you live in, we talked about this a little bit in the first hour, uh, in the territory you live in, what is the population there that uh, of your area? Right in our area, it's about 1.2 million uh, in in our area. Uh, the we live in we live about seven kilometers outside of the city. We're considered a suburb, and here uh, it's a rather small area. We probably only have about 7,000 right here. Uh, but you know, the whole area, of course, is 1.2 million. And of course, like just this morning in services, we have people drive out here. Uh, from the city for services. So I see. One okay. million. Wow. So slightly more than Evansville, Indiana. Just One, just a bit. Just a slight just bit. bit. Okay. And in that, uh, how many uh, fundamental Bible believing churches are there in the area that are ministering to that one point some million people? As far as fundamental Baptist churches, there would be two. Um, if you expanded that to even maybe some charismatic churches that actually preach the gospel, it would get up to about six churches. Uh -huh. Okay, so in that, that's not, you know, that's, uh, that's a big work for such a small group uh, of churches that are reaching out with the gospel. And I guess that really shows the importance of what God is doing in and through uh, David, through you and Dee Dee and your ministry there. Um, what, how can we best pray for you? What are some things that we can pray with you about? Well, of course, um, you know, finances is always something that, you know, is, is always an issue here because it's a very expensive place to live. Now, praise the Lord, uh, you know, as of last November, I say praise the Lord for us, it's been nice. Uh, but with the price of oil falling, of course, the dollar is worth much more than it was uh, before. So we've experienced... Uh, a period of relief, if you will, for us personally as, as missionaries. Uh, but the, the other main thing is really we need good national leadership here. We need some young men and some men uh, to step up and really uh, produce some, some good, strong uh, national leadership. Now, is there a lot of opposition uh, there in Siberia and Russia against the church and Christians? No, um, I, I wouldn't say that. I really wouldn't. Um, right now, probably the biggest uh, barrier we have uh, to people that do not know us uh, would be the fact that we're U.S. citizens. Uh, now, my wife and I, we can, we can pass off as Russians, so that's fine. But some of the other missionaries, eh, not so much. Um, so they sometimes they could you know, get a little feedback and things like that. But as far as the government, no, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have more freedom here, literally, uh, probably than than you guys do in the United States, honestly. Yeah, and so you're. I think you said in the first service, probably another ten years will be or fifty years will be moving to Russia, right? <laughs> I don't know if you ever have to run somewhere for uh, to flee religious persecution. It's a good place to get to. <laughs> okay, how many of you want to sign up for that? <laughs> I'm not seeing any hands yet. <clears throat> So what, what temperature, what's the temperature like <clears throat> there in Siberia? Is it pretty warm all the time? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not as bad as people say. You know, people used to think that we would drive dog sleds, that we would etch our welcome mats out of a piece of ice and things like that. It, it's not like that. So you don't, have, you don't have dogs pulling your car or anything like that? No, although I could have used somebody to pull my car about three months ago we we didn't even get to tell you guys about this in our prayer letters it was a real answer to prayer but our, our car broke down the engine blew uh, while we were out on evangelization actually and uh the lord worked it out where somebody had sent us a gift not even knowing that we were gonna that we had this need because we didn't even know we had the need and uh without even you know sending out a prayer letter um the lord just took care of all of it wow that's amazing that so was a that, blessing that is awesome so the temperature we we're saying so get yes. warm, is it warm summer, there? Yeah. Summer, we, we can have 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It can get quite warm. 
Um, and with that humidity uh, up near 90, uh, but during the winter, of course, during the coldest times of the year, February, usually the last two weeks of January, first two weeks of February, we'll have 40 below zero. Um, and with that humidity uh, in, in the 80s, high 80s. So did that 80s. help to encourage any of you to want to go to Russia? <laughs> 40 below zero, does that help? All right. Well, that uh, you you are sacrificing in ways that apparently we can't get some of these folks to do. Uh, they don't want to go to Russia at that kind of weather. Uh, but you know what? It's a God call, right? And you're there because God has called you to be there. And, yes, sir. Uh, I, you know, D.D. and David, I want you guys to know we love you. We love you as a church. We appreciate you representing us as a work and a ministry, uh, an extension of who we are. But more importantly, you're there representing uh, Jesus Christ and uh, presenting the gospel in a region of the world that apart from missionaries like yourself going would never hear. And so we appreciate you being there on our behalf. Well, we appreciate you giving us the opportunity to represent you here. Well, and, you know, all in all, we've been supporting you for how long now? Oh, now, you, before give, I was give married, some, so Give some be, of the detail. For years. You were, you were given some detail in the first service, so don't, don't be afraid to repeat yourself because there's not anybody in this service that was in that service. So, uh, you know, if you might remember any of that, some of the details, I think one of the things you said is we were supporting you before you were even married. Right, before, before I was married, I, I'd have to say it'd be 22, 23 years ago. Yeah, amen. So we've, been, uh, we've got a long working relationship with the Sterlings and uh, supporting them and their work and their ministry. And uh, is there anything that you'd like to, uh, like to say to the church before we uh, disconnect here and let you go to bed? Well, again, I'd just like to say thank you that... Uh, you know, you are one of the, the churches that is willing to support works that may not be as glamorous uh, as some, where, you know, we're, uh, as, as my pastor would say, the tip of the spear. You know, you're the Marine Corps. You're the first one hitting the beach, and you're not there maybe getting all the accolades, but somebody's got to be the first one to, uh, to hit the beach and go on. And that's what the Lord has called us to do, is to be the first ones to come in here. And, uh, again, sometimes... Uh, you just got to stick with it, put down roots. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, that demands supporting churches that are willing uh, to put down roots and and just stick it, stick with it, see it through, and just wait for that harvest. Amen. Well, we appreciate you doing that. And Dee, I know you've been real quiet there in the background. Yeah, can't. You know, David is very smart by putting you in the picture. It makes him look better. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you're welcome. Well, um, is there any questions? Anybody have any particular question that you'd like for me to ask David before we disconnect here? All right, they're a quiet bunch. So, yeah, they're all uh, nervous now. Yeah, I think so. I put them on the spot. So anyway, well, David, thank you so much, and we appreciate you staying up uh, in these late hours, or early morning, uh, to be able to be with us here, and it means a lot to us because... Here it's uh, almost 11.30, and uh, I realize, again, it's almost uh, 12.30 there, right? Yep, Except, yep I'm looking at your <laughs> clock. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's, on the, it's across you your other shoulder. You see the ceiling. That's right. And, and what room are you in right now? Uh, this is actually, this is our front room, and this is where we have the adult services, and then uh, the boys uh, team meetings this is where we have this is where we have those I got you awesome awesome yeah. well that uh, again we appreciate even though we're an hour apart plus yeah. <laughs> we, appre we appreciate so much you uh, meeting with us and thank you for taking taking us in to Monday is there anything we need to know about Monday before we actually get there <laughs> not that I know of I haven't seen any game scores or anything so no, okay not all right good deal all right. Well, God bless you, and you guys have a have a wonderful uh, a wonderful week. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. All right. What an awesome opportunity to uh, connect with our our missionaries, and uh, what a blessing in, in technology. Wonderful <laughs> in this regard, um, missionaries. 
years gone by would have loved to have the opportunity to stay connected like that. And uh, what a privilege it is for us to be able to connect. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, uh, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I want to share with you this morning uh, from this passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we are still, uh, we are continuing our, our, our theme um, simply having to do with hope goes global. And we're, by the, by the grace of God, we're still going to connect with a few more missionaries here in the next week or so. And uh, we don't want to lose the opportunity to make those connections. We love our missionaries. Some of you maybe have never met our missionaries. Uh, you haven't got to know them real well, but I want to encourage you to get to know them. Uh, we have some uh, brochures in the back. They have our eight different missionaries that we support. Tells a little bit about them and where they're from. I would encourage you to get that and also use that as a prayer list to pray for our missionaries and what God is doing with them and through them in their different countries. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, I'm going to read here in verse uh, in verse 13 here in just a moment. But before we actually do get into the reading, I would appreciate it so much if you would take time uh, to bow with me and to petition the throne of God first. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning that we have to be in this place. It's not by mistake, it's by your design. God, you tell us that you direct the steps of a righteous man. Lord, we're not righteous because of ourself. It's not self-righteousness. It's righteousness that is uh, given to us, imputed to us. It's your righteousness. And God, we're righteous because of you. And so, Lord, as your righteous saints, you direct our steps every day. God, we know that it's not by mistake that we're in this auditorium this morning, in these pews, in this auditorium at 11.30 in the morning to be challenged by the message of your word, that your Holy Spirit would do the work that only he can do in our life. And God, I pray this morning that the message will be one that every person in this place will realize it was tailor-made just for them by you. God, I thank you that you're willing to work in us and through us, not because of who we are, but despite who we are, you're willing to do that anyway. God, I pray this morning that each person will leave a different person than they were when they came in the door. Those that are lost, that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today will be the day they surrender themselves to you and call on you as Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, those that you're knocking at their heart's door, to be more faithful and consistent in their walk with you, to make impacts in the lives of those around them. God, I pray that each person will respond according to your work this morning. And we give you the praise, the honor, and glory in Christ's name. And all of God's people say, Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse number 13 and following. And this is the Apostle Paul that is writing, and he simply says, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. Now again, Paul was a missionary. And he took a lot of missionary journeys, and he, he, he would be very purposed in his mission of what God wanted to do in and through him and one of the things I want you to understand is that Paul is saying here in this passage that he does not boast beyond the area of influence that God has assigned him the opportunity to have. We'll enter into that a little bit more in discussion here in just a few moments. Verse 14 goes on to say, For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Now here's what I think is really cool. We have missionaries that go into the far reaches of the world and some of those missionaries are the first ones to present the gospel of Jesus Christ in those areas. That's amazing. And he goes on to say in verse 15, For 
uh, it goes on to say, we do not boast beyond limit in the labor of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area of influence or in by the work of somebody else. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Here's what I want us to see this morning in this simple passage of scripture is that Paul, as a missionary, is saying, look, God has provided us opportunity to be the first to reach people with the gospel of Christ in some ways in some areas. But he also goes on to say, but I'm very thankful for what God has done through others, but I'm not gonna boast or I'm not gonna take credit for anything that God has done in and through somebody else. Now hear me out, church. This is very important because I'm gonna bring application to that passage right here. We're gonna unpack that and make it very personal. You ready? Here's the thing. What Paul is saying, and that applies to us, is that we have a work of ministry that's happening through missionaries around the world. And it's a powerful work in mission. And, and there are those within the church, again, keeping in mind, I'm a third generation pastor, I've gone to church all my life, I've watched these things happen, uh, where it is, it is not uncommon that a church that is giving is not going to have 100% participation in financially helping and supporting missionaries. And that shouldn't be that way, but that's unfortunately the way it is. But hear me out. But there are those who do not give and do not support, and yet they take a lot of boasting and pride in what they're doing as a church to reach others with the gospel of Christ. And Paul said, look, I'm not going to take credit for the work of another man's hands. So a living example to us would be this. Rather than just taking pride in the work and ministry of the mission of Milrow Baptist Church and yet not being a part financially in supporting it and yet somehow taking a taking pride in the fact of what your church is doing. And it's awesome what the church is doing and, and what God's doing through our missionaries. But rather than taking, rather than boasting in the work of other people sacrificing and laboring and giving, that we ought to participate and be a part as well. That we be like Paul and say, any boasting that I do, I will do because God has allowed me to be used to make a difference. Now, again, I want to be really cautious in helping you understand. When it's talking about boasting, it's not talking about putting up a billboard or standing up in church going, hey, I've got money for missions right here, and it's exactly this amount of money. Watch me put it in the plate. It's not talking about that. It's talking about having a sense of confidence that what you're doing is right. And it's not based on what other people are doing. It's based on what God's doing in and through you. It's an internal boasting. And it's not a prideful boasting. It's a boasting. Look at what the verse says there in the last two verses. Verse 17 18. Let the one who boasts, and it doesn't say we shouldn't boast, we can boast, but who are we to boast in? Let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. It's about saying, look what God has been able to do in and through my life. And there may be some that would look at you and go, but I didn't think you had much anything. I know, isn't it awesome what God can do? Because little is much when God's in it. Isn't it amazing what God's willing to do through those who are willing to boast in him? It's not about boasting in ourselves and what we're able to do or capable of doing, but boasting in the Lord. 
matter of fact, if all that you give in the way of missions or in the work of ministry at all is just what you're capable of doing, then all you have the ability to do is to boast in yourself. But when you have to step out by faith and say, God, you know what? These are things I'm incapable of doing myself, but God, I'm trusting you. You've laid it on my heart to do this, and God, I'm trusting you to lead me through it and provide for me. And then six months later, you're able to stand up and say, I was able to make a commitment to give in a way that I couldn't do beyond within myself, but I want to stand and boast in the Lord for what God has done in and through me. Not because it's me, it's because it's who he is. Listen, we're like a conduit. You know what conduit is, don't you? We're like a, we're like a water line. Can a water line provide water? Okay, that's kind of a trick question, isn't it? Can the water line in and of itself provide water? It cannot in and of itself provide water. It has to have a resource that flows water, but through that water line, water can be provided, right? But the water line has to make itself available to the source. And when we say to God, God, I know that you are the source of all things. God, I know you want to you wanna financially take care of the, the ministry and the, and the missionaries around the world. I know you want to do that. God, you are the source. God, I am making available myself as a water line in order that you can provide in and through me what you want to do. Now I can tell you this, when you put yourself and position yourself in a way that you allow God to, to use you, there's blessings that, that flow through you that you get to experience too. So for instance, a water line that doesn't have water running through it gets dry, parched, and maybe even corrosion begins to develop in it because there's not a flow through it. You know why some of us may find ourselves in a place of feeling like our life is stagnant? It's because we've not allowed the source to work and move through us. But yet when we make ourselves available, there's a blessing that comes to the water line just as much as the ones who are provided the resources on the other end of that water line. Isn't it amazing what God can and will do through us when we position, position ourselves? But our boasting is not in ourself. Our boasting is in the Lord. Verse 18 says, For it is not the one who commends himself or compliments himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends or lifts up. Listen, I, what I give to missions and what I do in the local ministry has nothing to do with me feeling proud of myself. It has everything to do with saying, God, thank you that you're willing to use a knucklehead like me. Every one of us need to understand that God's willing to use us, Not again, not because of what we have or because of who we are, but despite who we are and despite what little we may have. God still wants to use us. Why, do we, why should we as Paul want God to use us? Look at verse 15 if you would. Let's go back there to verse 15. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, now get this, I love this, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area of influence. Here's what he's saying. When we are faithful to allow God to do in and through us what he wants to do to reach somebody right here, the reason why I want to see that happen is in order that God will increase the faith of those that we've reached in order that they'll be like a launching pad to go out and reach people beyond our limits and our ability. That's what real missions is all about. 
How do we reach the world with the gospel of Christ? There's no way in the world that any one person is gonna be able to go around and make influence and, and, and have conversations with everybody in the world, but you can make a difference in one person's life who can make a difference in a world of people of their own. And for every person that we make a difference and influence in their life, we're touching a whole different sphere of influence. You know what a blessing it is to watch somebody surrender their life to Jesus and get saved? Next thing you know, they're calling me, saying, Preacher, I had an opportunity to talk to my, my aunt, my uncle, my cousin, my nephew, my niece. By the way, I got some people coming to church on Sunday. You know how blessed it is to watch how the influence of that one person all of a sudden begins to expand into their influence? I think sometimes we get too narrow-minded. We think, oh, my little bit wouldn't matter. My friend, little is much when God is in it. When we plant what little God gives us the opportunity to do, he can begin to cause that to spring up into living fruit and that, that it begins to have influence beyond our own personal ability to reach the lives of other people. That it says here, that the gospel, that, that in verse 16, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you. And not just going somewhere else where somebody else has already got the work going and already got things happening and we go in and we take credit for something that's already going on as though we're a part, uh, as though somehow we did that. No, he's saying in order that we can go in places where influence has not even been had yet. So we have an opportunity in our faith partnership giving to unite together every individual person having the opportunity to say, Look, and this is not just for adults. I remember that I started when I was just a child in giving to missions because I wanted to make a difference. Parents, you may say, but my kids don't have a job. I really don't give them an allowance or anything like that. Well, maybe you ought to make an exception of saying, look, I'm as your parent going to provide you a quarter a week or whatever, 50 cents a week, a dollar a week or whatever, and I want you to take this dollar and I want you to give it towards mission and you're helping to train up a child in the way he should go so when he is old he'll not depart from doing just that when he does have a job or when she has a job or the ability to do it themselves. Parents, we have to train up our children and teach them what it's all about. And again, as and to set the influence and, and to let them see that we as parents are practicing the very thing that we're seeking to teach them to do in their life, that we give and that we participate in order that we can say, look, what God is doing and what God has allowed to happen in and through my life. Thank you, God, for letting me be that water line that your resources flowed through. And I've had some people say, Pastor, I just don't have, I don't have the ability. I don't have the wherewithal. I can assure you this, every one of us have resources. It will just stop and think it through and figure it out. Some may say, Pastor, you know, my, my work and labor, because what is it that your money in, it, it represents? What does it represent? Does it represent getting out and working with your hands all week long? It does, does it? It represents your life. Now, some of you may be here and you may be drawing Social Security or whatever. Well, let me just simply say this. You're not left out of this thing because here, listen, your Social Security just simply represents the time that you have spent laboring and giving and serving and, and that Social Security is made available to you in order that in order that it represents the life that you have lived and the ability and the influence you've been able to be a part. So it's not a matter that all oh, the money I have is just Social Security, it doesn't really represent anything. No, it does. It represents you. And we've had people on fixed incomes and everything else that have been a part in being a part in missions 
<clears throat> and there's been some who have said to them, oh, you really can't afford to do that, you shouldn't do that. And it's amazing the stories that I've heard of people have said, you know what, I know who the source is and I'm gonna trust him to provide in and through me what he says he wants to do. And I've had them come to me a year later and say, pastor, you'll never... You never dream what God did to provide for me and I was able to give and be faithful. And man, I, I would have missed out on the blessing had I not been willing to step out by faith and trust God. And therefore, that's why we call this faith partnership. It's a matter of stepping out by faith to be a part in what God's doing around the world. But may I also say that missions is more than just what we do around the world. Missions is what we do right here in the United States of America and the things that we do here to make a difference. Your sphere of influence here. So for instance, you go to the grocery store and there's a cashier. It seems like she has a smile on her face and has a vibrance about herself every time you go there. You ought to be willing to say to them, you know what, you are the biggest blessing to me and I just want you to know it means a lot to me to have an opportunity to go through your line. You just cheer me up every time I come through. Do you know what that could mean to a young lady standing behind that, that register? The difference you'd make? Now you might say, but pastor, you know what? That's normally true, but now that you said that, I walked through the line and the lady had the biggest, longest face and she was not in a good mood. I wished I'd picked another line. How about you look at her and go, sweetheart, you know what, I just want you to know something. You have been the biggest blessing to me every time I've come through line, through the line. You've always had, uh, you know, you've always just been so joyful and, and a great spirit and I can tell something's weighing on you today and I just want you to know I'm gonna be praying for you today. You know what that can mean to that young person or that older person standing there at that cash register? Matter of fact, you think that the next time you walked in the store, they wouldn't be noticing you and seeing if you're going to come back through their line again? <laughs> I guarantee you they would. Why? Because all of us have a sphere of influence and every one of us need to take up on that opportunity to literally make a difference even in the smallest ways that God gives us opportunity to do it. We need to live a purpose-driven life, a life that is done on purpose, not by accident, but making a difference. So this week, and I realize I'm probably gonna hit some taboo here, and that's fine. We're all mature adults, and we'll weed through this, all right? But here's the thing. This is a place that God's brought us as a family. We've had an opportunity to take up on, on Halloween night to make a difference in our neighborhood, in our community, and God gave us just this week, we went through, we give full-size candy bars out. I hope we clip this part offline, John. I'm kidding. Um, we, we give away full-size candy bars, hot chocolate, and hot dogs. And we had 180 Hershey bars that we gave out and had to kick then into airheads that we started giving out. And all in all, I would say that we gave away somewhere around 230, 240 pieces of candy last night but every piece of candy that went out went out with a gospel track with it and we were able to share Jesus Christ through that as well as making connection with our neighbors in a way that we don't get that opportunity any other time of the year. Now listen to me, I realize there may be some in here this morning that say oh that's the devil's day and we shouldn't do anything. Listen if you want to give away a day to the devil you go right ahead but he ain't getting none of these days. Because I want to tell you something. The Bible tells us that every day is the same unto the Lord. And, and here's what the scripture says, that when it comes to the church, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You know what that means? That means a church can storm the gates of hell and the gates of hell can't stand when the church goes up against them. Now hear what I'm saying to you this morning. The only way that the gates of hell continue to stand is when the church does nothing. I don't know about you, but I'm going to storm those gates and I'm going to take up on every opportunity that we have as a body of believers to share the gospel of Christ even through Halloween. Now, let me give you something that I, I don't know if any of you, some of you may know this. I think it's really cool. 
We have a neighbor that's cross street from us and here's how it all played out. That neighbor, the first year that we moved into the house, we did lights and we have music and we had candy and doing all that and here's the way it worked. Our neighbor, the first year, he and his wife, lights out, no porch lights on. They didn't participate in Halloween in this regard. They didn't give out candy or anything. But he told me later, he said the first year, they had lift their blinds and look out and think, what in the world is that preacher doing? <laughs> they couldn't understand. But then after they watched the influence that we had in our neighborhood and the people's lives that we were able to touch and the families, listen to me, how many times in the world do we have an opportunity to have our neighbors come to us and want what we have? I mean, I've gone knock on doors and I hope they open the door or that they're not rude when they come to the door. But in this regard, they're coming to our house. So they're gonna be gracious and receive whatever it is we give them and we give them and we share the gospel. We provide that. And when our neighbor across the street saw that what was going on, the next year came around, his wife said, hey, Dave, do you think we ought to pull out our popcorn machine and become a part of this? And he said, why not? So next thing you know, he's pulling out his popcorn machine. So now, yesterday, they had a popcorn machine and a cotton candy machine, and we were giving away candy across there. We were sugaring everybody up. We had other neighbors that were giving and participating and here's the comments that came back to us from people that came through. They said, this is the coolest neighborhood that a person could ever come to for Halloween. Listen, when Christians do it, they ought to do it right. By the way, my neighbor's a Christian, he and his wife. And when anybody does something, if anybody should get it right, it should be believers. The world should never outdo us when it comes to our ability to make an influence and make, have a, make a difference in people's lives. We had several kids that came through and said, man, we love coming to your house. You guys do it awesome and we love this. Had one neighbor who came through, it was a grandmother and her grandkids used to live in the neighborhood in behind us and they moved about six, eight months ago. And the grandma came up to me and she said, I just wanna let you know that even though my grandkids have moved out of the neighborhood, I don't live in this neighborhood, but even though they don't live in the neighborhood anymore, they have been relentless about how they wanted to come back to this house this Halloween. Now, I wanna tell you something, it's awesome. Every year, God has let it grow a little bit more and a little bit more. Not only did we give out 230, 240 pieces of candy, that only represents the kids that came to our house and that only represents children. Our neighbor next door who gave away popcorn, gave away popcorn to every single person and he said it was around 400 people that was there in the neighborhood. Can you imagine the opportunity and influence we're able to make in the lives of a lot of people. What's that about? It's not about boasting in ourselves. It's boasting in the Lord and what opportunities God makes available. We ought to buy up on those opportunities and make an impact. So that's what your preacher's doing. I'm not saying that's what you ought to do. You may have some feelings about that and it may would be sin for you to do such a thing because if you don't have faith in your own heart that's right, then you shouldn't do it. But my friend, I want to tell you something. Whatever God gives you the opportunity to do to make a difference in the lives of those that he brings into your life, you ought to take up on that opportunity and make a difference because this is more than just financial. This is emotionally getting involved in allowing God to use us. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning,